everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's Director of Personnel. We're glad you're with us for this episode of Ask Anything, and with us today is a repeat offender. We're bringing back Chad Weed, who's going to be talking to us about character in leadership. It doesn't matter where you are, business, government, military, a leader's character plays an important part of their leadership style. A leader's character can affect the performance of their entire team and often make the difference between success and failure. And to talk a little bit more about that, here with us today is Chad Wheat. Chad is the director of Mosher Consulting's Core Technology Solutions Division. He has been with Mosher for 14 years and with Mosher Managed Services since its inception. Originally from Indiana, he now resides in Florida. In his career and personal life, Chad has been involved with mentoring, leadership, and coaching, serving on several civic boards and charities. Chad, it's great to have you with us on Ask Anything. How are you? Well, on hill, thanks. And uh, yes, the hurricane passed us by with no problems, just a lot of water. <laughs> I was about to ask you uh, about that. Yes, because you live in that side of Florida. No, it was no problem. Um, I do feel for the people up around the Big Bend area, they got a lot harder than we did. So uh, we're, we're fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after last year and now this year, that's twice yeah. in a year around the same area, obviously. So for the folks down there who are still recovering, we wish you well. And uh, hopefully you guys will get back on your feet soon. Let's talk about character and leadership, because as I explained in the opening, character plays a huge role in leadership, more specifically on leadership type. It could make or break a team and lead to either many successes or failures. It can influence many things, even some that we might not think about. So let's talk about character and leadership. Well, I think it's important to understand that in successful businesses, there is obviously great leadership. That's usually the norm rather than the exception. And I think there's really a small percentage of industry, especially IT industry, corporations that exhibit great leadership. I think, you know, we have a lot of good leadership, but what separates a great leader versus a good leader is what I really started focusing on for recent research into uh, actually military leadership, because I'm sort of a history freak. And as I got reading about it, I started thinking, you know, this applies to not just military, this applies to every kind of organization, whether it's government, civic, uh, private industry, or whatever. So I just thought it'd be interesting to take a look at some of these characteristics and what divides great from good. Absolutely. So there's a lot to unpack there because I, I do agree with you. Leadership, whether you display, you know, display it on a business field, government, military, across the board, it's basically the same. You know, people will follow good leaders. They will go to bat for them, they will go, you know, to use a military term, they will go to a battlefield for them if they're good leaders. And in business and government work, it's the same. I mean, if you have a good leader, somebody that you trust, somebody that you know has your back, you're going to go to work for that person. Your productivity is probably going to be higher for that person because they influence that on you. They have that type of influence. Right. And that uh, sort of brings me to the first couple of points that you sort of alluded to. Uh, one hallmark of a great leader is loyalty. And that doesn't just mean loyalty to his superiors on the chain of command or in the, the org chart, but you also have to have loyalty to the teams that report to you. And in an article I was reading, it, it characterized George Washington. He was He was loyal to his men, but he was also loyal to the fledgling Congress of the United States when he could have, you know, a lot of people were saying, let's make Washington King. He was like, no, he was loyal to both the Congress who gave him his orders, but he was loyal to his men too. And through that also, the, the other point was a great leader has to be focused on service and not just on themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and leaders who are guided by a servant leadership model become great leaders. And again, to use a military uh, example would be uh, the Marine General Chesty Puller, who, you know, he led from the front. He strove to ensure his men had the adequate uh, supplies and tools, ammunition, et cetera. And I think if we look at that from an industry, especially IT industry, you have to equip your people. You have to help them be empowered to make decisions. They have to have the right tools. They have to have the right knowledge sets. So that's to me, you know, is, is sort of a hallmark. You have to be service oriented. You have to ask yourself, what can I do to help my team be better? Because if your team is better, 
you become better, your organization becomes better. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads us into the next question. Why is it important for leaders to have character in their leadership style? Yeah, that's a that's a huge <laughs> topic. Um, <It's... laughs> I, I think here, and there's a couple other points here. So a great leader has to have both self-awareness and self-regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. Self-awareness, you have to understand your own strengths and weaknesses. I don't think there's any great leaders out there who think I do everything great. You know, that to me, that's a mark of a, of a weak leader. You have mm -hmm. to understand what your strengths are, what you bring to the table, but you also have to understand your limitations. And if you have those limitations, you either strive to improve on those limitations or you put people in place on your team that help strengthen your limitations and this self-awareness and self-regulation, that trait leads to integrity and openness and the ability to accept change, understanding your limitations and your strengths. You know, to circle back on what you said earlier about Washington and that type of leader and to tie it to what you were just saying now, it's okay not to know something when you're right. a leader. It's okay. It's, it shows signs of humility of, you know, you being humble and understanding that the fact that you don't know that maybe you have the opportunity then to level up somebody to then allow somebody else to take the reins for a second or to show off their skills. And in the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at building up your team, that to put it to layman's term, that gives you brownie points amongst your groups because you're giving them opportunities to shine and like you were saying you're not taking all that credit to yourself you're basically saying no i you guys are the experts you know what you're doing i trust you and if there's something that i don't know i don't have an issue going around asking my team members hey could you give me a hand on this or can you lead this project for me can right. you lead this piece and that is just going to garner you and, and it's so many brownie points with your teams. It's, it's amazing what it does. Yeah. Another great example is like in sports, you know, with football season just starting, I, I'm a huge college football fan. And one of my wife's friends asked me, what does a head coach really do? It seems like, you know, the, the other coaches do a lot of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. so I thought a minute and I said, well, really a head coach, he coordinates you know, the whole puzzle, he puts a staff in place that can take those certain areas. You know, he trusts those people with their leadership and their intelligence in a particular area where it's, you know, offense, defense, quarterback, whatever. And so he has to court, sort of build that team core around the values that he set and put the people in place. Now, obviously, sometimes, especially new leaders, you inherit a team, right? And slowly you try to either get them on board with what you're saying and what your philosophy is, but you also have to show them, again, back to that self-awareness and, and self-regulation, you have to show them that you buy into them and show them loyalty and show that you're buying into the corporate picture. So that's all sort of a, a vast wheel that rotates, being able to put the right people in the right place. And even, you know, again, covering for whatever perceived weaknesses you may have. Yeah. And I think this is a perfect example that actually answers what my next question was going to be, which is how does character and leadership influence others? And I think you hit the nail right in the head with the coach example, because yes, when we look at a college football team or, or just a football team in general, the head coach, they're the head, but that doesn't mean that the people around them, those defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, special teams coordinator, they have a game plan of their own. It's up right. to him, like you say, to take that puzzle and put it together and find that balance, that perfect balance that's going to deliver the win. And so right. it is a perfect example of a, of a leadership role that allows you to move all these pieces around, but that you're depending on other people to make the team look great too. It's not just yeah. you. You're the mastermind, if you will, the person that basically is looking at the board from 20,000 feet while the coordinators are moving the pieces around. And so yeah. it's up to you to just put it together. Yeah, I think that, and, and you perfectly segued to my, my next point was uh, great leaders have to have a, a great deal of empathy. And mm -hmm. when I'm talking about empathy, I'm saying, you know, that that's a trait that allows leaders to understand the emotional the emotions and the motivations of other people. So a leader with a great 
say, cross-cultural sensitivity, like Dwight Eisenhower, when he led the Allied war effort, he was mm -hmm. Supreme Commander. He didn't understand, you know, the different cultures that came together to become the Allies. Another good example I, I, I found in my research was Colin Powell, uh, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I, I found a quote about him that said, Powell frequently adopted an open and compassionate approach but he was less inclined to use coercive power. Instead, he sought to inspire quality performance. And to me, that is almost, in a nutshell, what makes a great leader. You have to inspire the quality performance. And that takes into consideration those other things about being service-oriented, loyal, perseverant, and uh, sort of being able to bring the whole jigsaw puzzle together. Yeah, that's a, that's a great quote for uh, Mr. Powell, because that I feel like that is a great, describing one liner for a man that was really had a lot of inspirational moments during his time. Mm -hmm. And, and he did a lot of great things for our military. So he is definitely someone to go back and research and read from, because he was a great leader. I mean, he was, he was. Yeah. yeah. Like sort of like Eisenhower, he had a, actually a more complex situation. He was combining vastly different cultures, mm -hmm. like, where Eisenhower had taken, you know, Western Europe and North yes. America and, you know, uh, allies together. Well, Powell had to organize Arabic, Hispanic, Western European. I mean, he had vastly different cultures that he tried to to mold into one purpose and very successfully, I, I would think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we've talked about great leadership, some of these traits that great leaders have have to have in order to influence others and just bring out the best when somebody doesn't have that how can it hinder a team's development yeah i think um i won't generalize but i think everybody has had bad bosses <laughs> <laughs> shout out to mary no i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> shout out to david and my yeah anyway um yeah so there's I've never had a boss named mary by the way i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> I did have one named David, but that was many years ago. Anyway, but when you ask people why why were they a bad boss, you typically get a lot of the common answers, and it's sort of the antithesis of what the things we've been talking about. They weren't servant leaders. They weren't self-aware. They were demanding for no apparent reason. They set unrealistic expectations. I, I once had a boss way back when. This is way before Mosier. Thank you. Mosier's been great with leadership where he kept coming to me every day and said, this is your number one priority. This is your number one priority. And after mm. about a couple of weeks of that, I was like, so which is really my number one priority? What you said today or what you said last week right. was? And it was sort of unrealistic. But again, that empathy, you know, you have to feel what your team's going through. We had a situation, an outage with a customer a few weeks ago, and I was staying on top of it. I wanted to, you know, make sure my team was doing what they needed to do. But the most important thing I could do right then and there during the crisis was stay out of their way. You know, let them handle it. Don't ask stupid questions or ask for updates every 10 minutes. I, I let them do what they do. And then later, you know, we can go back and diagnose what went wrong yeah. after the root cause, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think empathy is one of the <laughs> marks of a bad leader, uh, as well as great empathy is a mark of a great leader. And, you know, that can even lead on held to talking about social skill. When I interview people to come into a, a tech role here at Mosier, I like to get to know them. I like to see what makes the person tick rather than their technical skills or their certifications. Those are very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we said this during the last podcast, gone are the days where there's a, a computer nerd sitting in his basement, swilling Mountain Dew and hacking away on a keyboard. Today's tech professional has to have social skill because really the entire job is about communication, right. communicating solutions, communicating things that are best practices to prevent outages, things like that. So uh, I'm looking for people that have that social skill and that loyalty. And obviously in, in our service industry, our service oriented to. Going back to what you were saying about characteristics of bad leaders, like the awareness piece really, to me, stands out because yeah. I think we can all agree we've had, for all those traits that you mentioned, we've had somebody who's had either one or multiple of those. I had the privilege of having somebody that pretty much had all of those that you described in one that had the zero self-awareness about what they were asking, the limitless 
lofty goals that they wanted. And of course, they wanted them tomorrow, not, you know, within a, an appropriate measure of time. The change in priorities, they changed daily. I, I wish it would have been weekly, but daily was my thing. So, and it's kind of hard, especially when it's one of your first few opportunities to be under leadership. I was blessed that my first leader and my very first job in an internship in a human resources office was an awesome director of HR that to this day, I still live by everything he taught me and, and how to treat people, how to you know show respect to everybody from the janitor all the way up to the CEO of a company. So mm -hmm. to go from that to then the person I described, a minute ago, it's kind of like a crash landing for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, imagine you're 20, I, I think it was 23 at the time. So I go from five years of that, almost six years of that to then five years of this. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what to describe it. It's, it was just a terrible time in my life, yeah. but I just kept going back to the good things that I learned from my first manager and the people that I, that, that I was around with those first six years of my work experience my professional experience yeah. and i just i remember thinking to myself back then when i was 23 24 i don't want to be like this person right i mean I, I i had no intentions of being on leadership roles at the time but i knew right then and there that if i ever became a leader this is not what i'm going to do yeah. i am not going to be walking around the hallways at 8 01 a.m <laughs> My people are all on their desks and, you know, seeing, checking what they're doing because it's 8.01. They're already on the clock. They should have their email up or whatever software they're using to do their work. And that was something that's, again, stuck with me. And as much as the good stuck with me from my first manager experience, this bad one stuck with me too. Yeah. And things that's not thing. to do. Yeah. You can learn from bad leadership too. And I've done the same thing. I, I've mentioned I've had bad bosses before. And you know, I, I was the same way on how I was like, when I'm a manager or leader, I'm going to learn from this and never, ever do yeah. that. And that brings up another couple of uh, points about uh, great leadership uh, is mentorship and, mm -hmm. and lifelong learning. Mentorship, obviously, you know, it's that philosophy that you hear in the NFL or wherever saying, you know, next man up, next man up, next woman up, whatever. You have to sort of train your replacement while you're still doing the job, because I think Again, with that uh, self-awareness, we're not going to be here forever. No. Someday we're going to retire or move on or whatever. But I want to make sure whoever takes my place is well-equipped and well-prepared to do that. And that lifelong learning, I think, you know, if you look back on the great coaches, the great political leaders, and, and the great military leaders, they they were all great learners. And, though, you know, while book learning and academics can't teach as much as, you know, experience, I think great leaders also dedicate time to always be learning and honing their skills and not just sitting back and, you know, taking as it comes. It makes you become more of a, a thought leader than just somebody sitting back and accepting what's coming down the line at you, uh, more proactive than reactive. And again, in, in the IT industry, that's, that's huge because as you know, the things we talked about five years ago are nowhere near what we're experiencing now. And in the next five years with AI and all, you know, the cloud-based computing, we have to be sort of learning all this and, you know, being reactive. So we're not taken by surprise and, and, and merely reacting to market conditions. Well, and you, to add to that, I would say you don't want to be ill-prepared, but you don't want your people to be ill-prepared either. It's one thing, again, like I mentioned earlier, to say, okay, I don't know about this, but then when you're not allowing yourself and, and in this case, your people, like you were mentioning, to learn, you know, I'm, I'll use IT's case, to learn new technologies, new new tools, new trade. I mean, all of that stuff is important to all of you. And so as all these technologies are developing, this is a great opportunity for somebody as a leader to take all of their people under their wing and say, okay, let's learn this together. Let's exactly. have this experience all together and just then, like you mentioned, you can sit down and then you can dissect and, and talk about what you just learned, et cetera. And it just makes it a heck of a lot better to learn things as a group than just individually. I think you share more experiences. You can maybe you maybe didn't pick up on something that Larry over there did. And hey, mm -hmm. you're learning now from Larry. And 
right? You no, know, now you maybe see something different in Larry because he learned something that you didn't. And so it can lead to all sorts of educational opportunities all around for everybody, learning opportunities. And I think it's really cool. I mean, I think it's, these are exciting times that we're living in right now, like, like you mentioned with AI, et cetera. And so it gives leaders an opportunity to lead, not just by example, but by practice. Right. And I think, you know, also in times of crises, right, either international or business or even down to a local customer having a crisis, whatever you learned and practiced is what you're going to fall back on. That's, that's what a characteristic is, right? So if the, uh, <laughs> let's say the hurricane comes up and you're prepared for it, hmm. you know, you are in a better position to control the outcomes and the fallout from it. So, but, you know, as we, as we know, we can plan and we can have procedure manuals and policy manuals, but when the uh, poop hits the fan, as it were, you're going to fall back on what you've practiced and what you've learned. And I guess one of the best examples, again, from the sports world would be Michael Jordan. Uh, everybody said that when he practiced, you couldn't tell that it was practice. He he played yeah. with that same intensity, that yep. same passion to win as he did during a game. And people are like, why do you practice so hard? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, he didn't, you know, trust luck. He made his own luck. And that was through perseverance and hard work. And I think that's a great lesson again transferring from the sports world into uh, even the it industry that reminded me uh because you were discussing general eisenhower earlier re uh, reminded me of a quote that i uh, know of his in preparing for battle i've always said plans are useless but planning is indispensable yeah, like it's, yeah. Uh, the actual plan no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy yep. uh, you know a plan probably not going to be a lot of use but planning and the ability to plan and to mm -hmm. think through things that is invaluable. Yep. Yeah. And that's why yeah. they, they have during training exercises like military, there's a reason they do the training exercise. They, they know very full well that as soon as you make contact with the enemy, all those plans are probably going to change. Yeah. Going out the window. <laughs> practiced and trained in certain methods and procedures you'll fall back on that and make it a, you know, if you have these best practices sort of ingrained in practice, you'll be able to react quicker to all, you know, these, these vast variables that come in and any contact. And for IT, you know, the contact with the enemy is the server outage or the network outage. Well, if yeah. we were following our procedures and what we've practiced and what we know, that'll be a lot more helpful to us and the customer in overcoming those things. Stephen Ambrose, the Band of Brothers book yes. and, and the mini series. I mean, it really, it was two leaders. Herbert Sobel gets a lot of crap uh, from the guys because they hated him. But one of the reasons they were able to do everything that they did was because he was so exacting during their training, uh, which then gave Dick Winters the ability to, he was a much more capable field commander with the ability to improvise and to move people. But without both of those guys' influence, they would not have been nearly as successful and like not nearly as many of them. I mean, even with their high casualty rate, it would have been higher. Yep. I'm thinking of an example too. It was uh, from Washington. Who was it? Ah, it, was, it was Von Steuben. I just had to look it up. So, you know, Washington had this sort of ragtag army, right? And we were getting beat left and right because we we're facing one of the best armies on earth. And so Washington knew he needed help, right? He'd served in the British military, but he didn't know how to sort of organize and drill and make this Continental Army uh, a viable resistance against the British. So he hired basically the, the Prussian general, Frederick von Steuben, to make the American army a professional army. And I think von Steuben is one of the uh, unheralded heroes in American military history, at least, because he he molded that army from, you know, a bunch of farmers and and you know tradesmen into an actual professional force that could oppose the British, who were a professional military. Before we go, how can a leader develop that character trait? I think part of it comes down to, and this is always been an argument, you know, with a lot of things, but especially in leadership, sort of nurture versus nature. I, I honestly believe that leaders do have to have some kind of basis to be sort of, quote, the natural leader. But that being said, I think mentorship and learning goes a long way. And, and mm -hmm. here I'll focus on mentorship again. 
great leaders not only mentor, we talked about next man up, but they also accept mentoring. Yep. And hell, you and I talked about having bad bosses. They were bad bosses, but you know what? We learned from them and we were mm-hmm. able to apply those lessons. And I think it's even if you're a CEO of an organization, you can find a mentor, you know, somebody who's been there and done that and faced those challenges. And I think that's important to always keep the, a mentoring relationship, both being a mentee and a mentor. I think that's important. And that goes a long way in developing these these traits and characteristics of, of great leadership. Yeah, mentoring is very important to any leader. I mean, whether you're at the top of the organization or at the bottom and you're looking to uh, move your way up, or even if you're at the top and you just want to level set your own expectations, right? you can look inward, you can look outside of the organization and to, to get some help. There's obviously professional coaches, et cetera, and whatnot, but I think it's key to develop yourself and that characteristic, that character that we're talking about here today. Because if you don't, if you don't do that, that's definitely going to be a missing ingredient in your toolkit of yeah. how to be a, an effective leader. I mean, because at the end of the day, what we want is to make sure that our people are safe, taken care of, they can do their job, and that we are not a distraction, that we're not something of a disturbance in the force. You know, we're, yeah. we're just... <laughs> We're just there to guide them. Well, thinking about it too is if if we're stagnant, and this comes from again military, right. sports, uh, industry. If we're stagnant, I can guarantee our opponent in whatever arena that is is not right. being stagnant. And those are the those are the the powers that are going to succeed. So we can't afford to be stagnant in leadership. Absolutely. So with that, chat weed. Thank you very much for joining us again on Ask Anything. We really appreciate your time and thank you for bringing this topic. Uh, This is a great topic. I could sit down and talk about leadership, any type of topic around leadership for days. So thank you. We'll do lunch. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And bring Brian, the producer in too, because he had a lot of good uh, commentary too. Thank you for listening into this week's edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. We hope you enjoyed listening to Chat We talk to us about character and leadership. Join us next time when we continue to dive deeper with our resident experts and what they're currently working on. Remember to send us your ideas or topics via social media feeds. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, so long, everybody. Go.